National Debt. Welcome to The Christian Economist. Hi, I'm Dave Arnott. Well, as you may have guessed, Christians are against the national debt, but let's see if we can figure out why. First, let me give you three forms of context for understanding national debt. We'll try to look at the past, how we got here, and maybe even some of the future and what we think is going to happen in the future. Well, let's see if we can get some context on this. If you're at your computer at home, go to U.S. Debt Clock. Just 11 letters, U.S. Debt Clock. If you're driving, I'll try to make this pictorial for you so you can keep your eyes on the road. But if you're at home on your computer, go to U.S. Debt Clock. I'll give you three forms of context for what's going on here. First, there's deficit. That's annual. Well, our annual deficit this year, as I'm recording this in December of 2019, our federal government, in the middle of this diagram, is taking in $3.5 trillion. Way over to the left in the red, you'll see our federal spending is $4.5 trillion. Yes, if you're good at math, the debt in 2019 is $1 trillion. The deficit that adds to the debt. Sorry if I said that wrong. Our annual deficit is $1 trillion. There's no question that in the future we will look back and say, you mean 2019 was one of the best economies in the history of mankind, yet your government overspent by one trillion? That's one form of context. We're taking in three and a half, we're spending four and a half. This is not sustainable, it cannot go on. Let me give you the second form of context here, and this is overall debt. And if you're looking at the U.S. debt clock, it's on the top left, U.S. national debt. This is our total debt that we've accumulated over the years. It's $23 trillion. Okay, million, billion, trillion. Uh, Christian economist, you're confusing me here. Give me some context. What is $23 trillion? If we stack the dollars, how high would it reach? That doesn't make any difference. What does make difference is how this compares to another number to give you some context, and that's what I'm here to give you. So our debt is $23 trillion. Our U.S. domestic product is $21.5 trillion in 2019. Here's how I explain it to the sophomores in my class at Dallas Baptist University. Your parents, let's say, both of them are working. They go out to a mortgage company to get a loan to buy a house. Well, they say to the mortgage company, we have this amount of income, the house will be this amount of debt. There you go. Debt versus income. So that's what we should do with these two numbers on the U.S. debt clock. Our U.S. national debt is $23 trillion. Our U.S. gross domestic product is $21.5 trillion. It's a simple ratio. But here's what happens. Remember in that story, I was talking about a student in my class. Both of their parents were working. What would happen if... One of the parents lost their job. The mortgage company would say, well, look, your debt of your house relative to your income has just doubled. And that is exactly what has happened in the 19 years that my college students have been on earth. If they were born in the year 2000, this debt to GDP ratio was 55%. Today, it is 106%. That's just like one of these students having their parents lose a job. The house payment is still the same, but their income is half. What has happened in the U United States with total debt? It's gone from 55% to 106%. So those three kind of contexts to think about. Annual deficit, $1 trillion. Debt is $23 trillion. Debt to GDP in the life of my 19-year-old sophomores at Dallas Baptist University, has gone from 55 to 106 percent. This is not good. How did we get here? Well, let's go to the past. In 1982, the government started borrowing from the Social Security Trust Fund. You can look online and find all kinds of articles for people saying, well, no, there are certificates, there are bonds, there are notes saying this money is going to be paid back. This is much like paying off your Visa card with your MasterCard or back to having two parents. It's like your mom borrowing from your dad and your mom saying, look, I've got a balanced budget. Yeah, but dad doesn't. And that's exactly what happens with the government. And I'm just astounded at reasonable economists who try to explain this away. The money is not there. 
In 1982, the government started borrowing against the Social Security Trust Fund, so much so that by 1999, there's a famous picture of President Bill Clinton on one side of a diagram and Vice President Al Gore on the other. And in the diagram, it says deficit, annual deficit, and they've got a great big zero. Well, that was true. In 1999, the government took in more money than it spent, but it was borrowing from the Social Security Trust Fund. And that's why it's going to go broke, we think, now in 2034. Well, so let's go back to these 19-year-old students sitting in my class. Think about it. If they're 19, <laughs> most of them haven't voted yet. That means they're suffering taxation without representation because they're going to own this, owe this money back. Oh, I've got a fourth context for you. Back to the U.S. debt clock if you're sitting at your computer. What we want to know is how much does each individual owe? Well, in my class, I use this book by Mankiw. And so I pass out a page that's been copied from a previous edition. And there's a crying baby. And it says, what? My percentage of the U.S. debt is 25000 In the next edition, I've passed out a copy to a student. It says, what? My share of the national debt is 41000 We ring up the U.S. debt clock and put it on the projector. Currently, in 2019, U.S. debt per citizen is $70,000. That is taxation without representation. They've not voted yet, yet they're being taxed. Ginger and I have seven grandkids. Each of them, as U.S. citizens, owes in federal debt $70,000. Are you depressed yet? One more depressing fact, then we'll try to get to some redemption on this subject. Uh, the future, it's not going to get better. No, it is going to get worse. Uh, in mid-2019, the U.S. president met with the Speaker of the House and the minority leader of, the, of uh, the Senate, and they proposed a $2 trillion spending. Well, this is just for even any reasonable economist. There just makes no sense. And for a Christian economist, it's a violation of the Eighth Commandment, which is don't steal. Now, look, Borrowing money is okay if you're doing it, if you're borrowing money, to spend it on some instrument that will increase your value in the future. Like my students at DBU. I mean, they should borrow as little money as possible, but it's okay to borrow money to earn a graduate a certificate saying you've graduated from Dallas Baptist University because that will make you richer in the future. Uh, one piece of data shows that each year of education increases a student's pay by 10%. Well, don't quibble with me about the 10%. They have earned a certificate which makes them richer in the future. Does the government do this? No. Let me look at the four top things that government spends its money on. Number one is Medicare, Medicaid. That is not an investment that can be used to make people richer. Two is Social Security. Three is defense and war. Four is interest on the national debt. That is going to go up, by the way. Currently, I'm recording this in December of 2019, the federal funds rate is 1.75%. The 10-year treasuries are selling for 1.8, under 2. That's going to go up. So we've got two dangerous things going up. Deficits are going up, debts are going up, and interest rates are going to go up. This will end badly. How will it end? Two different ways of viewing it. My view has been for many years that it would be a rolling down the hill of the U.S. currency, meaning eventually if economies around the world ever start to perform well, they're going to say, you mean you Americans have this huge debt of 106% of GDP, yet you want me to honor the U.S. dollar. They will honor the dollar less. Then what happens in 2034? It's predicted Social Security will run out of money. Well, people on both sides of the aisle have said, Social Security is a commitment. We have to keep it. If they do, and I believe they will, they will have to print money to do so. So you've got foreign Amex traders, meaning Forex traders, foreign exchange traders, saying the U.S. dollar is worth less. Interest rates are going up. You're having to print more to pay Social Security. That means the dollar would be worth less and you'll have to print some. Each time you print one, they become less. 
Each time they become worth less, you have to print one. Each time you print one, it becomes less. See the dangerous downward spiral that I predict will happen? But at least I'm positive in seeing it as rolling down a hill. The U.S. dollar will become worth less and less and less and less. There are others who see a more dramatic drop, that we will fall off a cliff. It will be like that Wile E. Coyote cartoon where he runs off the edge of a cliff and doesn't realize that he's over thin air and he's about to fall. I do not see it that way. However, the longer my prediction becomes unfulfilled of rolling down a hill, perhaps the closer we get to that drop. Look, they're both bad scenarios. This cannot end well. There's something in social science we call ceteris paribus. It's a Latin term that means all else being equal. All else being equal, having a debt to GDP ratio of 106% is going to be bad. Now, in the future, the nation and individuals will be richer or poorer because of many other effects. This individual effect, you could only predict it would make people richer if it was buying some instrument that would do so, like on highways or an internet system or airplanes or something that makes us richer. It does not. It is not like a DBU graduation certificate that makes people richer. I've told you the four largest expenditures from the federal government. None of them are investments that make us richer. Well, can we finally redeem this thing? Is there any good news, Christian economists? Come on. Is there? Uh, yes. There is some good news. And after getting students really depressed about this, I finally try to redeem the subject at the end. And it is this. It's only money. Yeah, you'll have less in the future and this debt, this intergenerational theft performed by my generation against the current generation of 19-year-olds is wrong, but it's only money. If you believe you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the amount of money you make won't take away your salvation. It won't take away your family. It won't take away your community. It won't take away your house. Now, you may have a smaller house because you will have less money. Ceteris paribus, this fact alone, means in the future you will be poorer because of the intergenerational theft, the violation of the Eighth Commandment that has been caused in our nation since we started this road down debt. The only positive ending is it's only money. And we believe in something much greater than money, don't we? We believe in the salvation through Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's another edition of The Christian Economist, where our motto is, Fear God, tell the truth, earn a profit. I'm Dave Arnott for The Christian Economist. See you next time.